Book Two, The Book of the Traveller of the Worlds, Canto One, The World Stare. Alone he moved, watched by the infinity, around him and the unknowable above. Alone who moved, Ashwapati. Alone he moved, watched by the infinity around him and the unknowable above. All could be seen that shuns the mortal eye. All could be known the mind has never grasped. All could be done no mortal will can dare. A limitless movement filled a limitless peace. In a profound existence, beyond earth's parent or kin to our ideas and dreams where space is a vast experiment of the soul in an immaterial substance linked to ours in a deep oneness of all things that are the universe of the unknown arose. So this is the wonderful description in the first paragraph of the world stair that Ashwapati climbs after he has got his siddhi and his yoga to has been completed to a far degree. He then climbs into another world to explore other dimensions and other spheres. And if you notice the last line here, in an immaterial substance linked to ours, in a deep oneness of all things that are, the universe of the unknown arose, a self-creation without end or pause revealed the grandeurs of the infinite. It flung into the hazards of its play a million moods, a myriad energies. The world shapes that are fancies of its truths and the formulas of the freedom of its force. It poured into the ever stable's flux a barkic rapture and revel of ideas, a passion and motion of everlastingness. There rose unborn into the unchanging surge thoughts that abide in their deathless consequence, words that immortal last, though fallen mute, Acts that brought out from silence its dumb sense, lines that convey the inexpressible. The eternal stillness saw in unmoved joy his universal power at work display. In plots of pain and dramas of delight, the wonder and beauty of her will to be all. Even pain was the soul's pleasure here, in this domain that Ashwapati has entered. All, even pain was the soul's pleasure here. So this is, of course, a, a description of this plane where words that are immortal, um, which have fallen mute, still abide in this plane, thoughts, that abide in their deathless consequence, acts that brought out from silence its dumb sense, the eternal stillness saw in unmoved joy. So this is an, the plane that Ashwapati has entered. All even pain was the soul's pleasure here. Here, all experience was a single plan. So there was a unity a unified uh, identity in this plane. 
the thousandfold expression of the one, all came at once into a single view. The entire thing came at once into a single view. Nothing escaped his vast intuitive sight. Nothing drew near he could not feel as kin. He was one spirit with that immensity. Images in a supernal consciousness are embodying the unborn who never dies. So images in a supernal consciousness embodying the unborn who never dies, the structured visions of the cosmic self, alive with the touch of being's eternity, looked at him like form-bound spiritual thoughts, figuring the movements of the ineffable. Aspects of being donned world outline, forms that open moving doors on things divine, became familiar to his early sight, the symbols of the spirit's reality, the living bodies of the bodiless, grew near to him, his daily associates, the exhaustless seeings of the unsleeping mind, the letterings of its contact with the invisible, surrounded him with countless pointing signs, the voices of a thousand realms of life, missioned to him her mighty messages. The heaven hints that invade our earthly lives, the dire imaginations dreamed by hell, which if enacted and experienced here, our dulled capacity soon would cease to feel, or our mortal frailty could not long endure, were set in their sublime proportions there. So the structured visions of the cosmic self the cosmic self, the world Purusha, alive with the touch of being's eternity, looked at him like form-bound spiritual thoughts, figuring the movements of the ineffable, aspects of being donned world outline, forms that open moving doors on things divine, became familiar to his early sight, the symbols of the spirit's reality, the living bodies of the bodiless, grew near to him, his daily associates, please note. So these symbols of the spirit's reality and the living bodies of the bodiless, that that cannot be expressed in form, grew near to him, his daily associates, the exhaustless seeings of the unsleeping mind, with a capital M, letterings of its contact with the invisible, surrounded him with countless pointing signs, the voices of a thousand realms of life missioned to him her mighty messages. The heaven hints that invade our earthly lives, the dire imaginations dreamed by hell, which if enacted and experienced here, our dulled capacity soon would cease to feel, or our mortal frailty could not long endure were set in their sublime proportions there in that world. There lived out in their self-born atmosphere. They resumed their topless pitch and native power, their fortifying stress upon the soul, bit deep into the ground of consciousness. The passion and the purity of their extremes, the absoluteness of their single cry, and the sovereign sweetness of violent poetry, of their beautiful or terrible delight. All thought can know or widest sight perceive, and all that thought and sight can never know, all things occult and rare, remote and strange, when near to heart's contact, felt by spirit sense. Asking for entry at his nature's gates, they crowded the widened spaces of his mind, his self-discoveries flaming witnesses, offering their marvel and their multitude. These now became new portions of himself, the figures 
of his spirit's greater life, the moving scenery of his large time walk, or the embroidered tissue of his sense. These took the place of intimate human things and moved as close companions of his thoughts. So these, all of this that has been described here, replaced or took the place of intimate human things. Human things began to disappear or become less important and instead of that, he became close to these kinds of images, thoughts, figures of his spirit's greater life and so on. So his, his consciousness totally widened and became unified in one with all that is occult, rare, remote and strange. And these entered into his nature's gates and crowded the widened spaces of his mind. His self-discoveries, flaming witnesses, offered their marvel and their multitude. These now became new portions of himself, the figures of his spirit's greater life, the moving scenery of his large time walk, or the embroidered tissue of his sense. These took the place of intimate human things, and moved as close companions of his thoughts, or were his soul's natural environment. Tireless the heart's adventure of delight, endless the kingdoms of the spirit's bliss. Unnumbered tones struck from one harmony strings, each to its wide-winged universal poise, its fathomless feeling, of the all in one, brought notes of some perfection yet unseen, its single retreat into truth's secrecies, its happy sidelight on the infinite. All was found there, the unique has dreamed and made, tingling with ceaseless rapture and surprise, and an opulent beauty of passionate difference the recurring beat that moments God in time. But look at the beautiful phraseology of the sentence. So poetic and absolutely captures, you know, it takes the English language to another level. All was found there, the unique is dreamed and made, tinging with ceaseless rapture and surprise, and an opulent beauty of passionate difference. The recurring beat that moments God in time. Only was missing the sole timeless word that carries eternity in its lonely sound. The idea, self-luminous key to all ideas. The integer of the Spirit's perfect sum. That equates the unequal all to the equal one. The single sign interpreting every sign. The absolute index to the absolute. There, walled apart by its own innerness, in a mystical barrage of dynamic light, he saw a lone, immense, high-curved world pile, erect like a mountain chariot of the gods, motionless, under an inscrutable sky, as if from matter's splint and viewless base, to a top as viewless, a carved sea of worlds, climbing with foam-maned waves to the supreme, ascended towards breaths immeasurable. It hoped to soar into the ineffable's reign. A hundred levels raised it to the unknown. So it tarred up to heights intangible and disappeared in the hushed, conscious vast as climbs a storied temple tower to heaven built by the aspiring soul of man to live near to his dream of the invisible. Infinity calls to it as it dreams and climbs its spire touches the apex of the world. Mounting into great voiceless stillnesses, it marries the earth to screened eternities. 
amid the many systems of the one, made by an interpreting creative joy, alone it points us to our journey back. So, amid the many systems of the one, made by an interpreting creative joy, alone it points us to our journey back, out of our long self-loss, in nature's deeps, planted on earth, it holds in it all realms. It is a brief compendium of the vast. This was the single stair to being's goal, a summary of the stages of the spirit, its copy of the cosmic hierarchies, refashioned in our secret air of self, a subtle pattern of the universe. So here what Sri Aurobindo is saying is that these, a lot of these, even these temples that we see, these high spires moving up to heaven, they are like symbols, they are refashioned, they actually, they are refashioned after the same that is in the above, in the higher spheres those worlds that are also pointing and going upwards. So, in a sense, he is, he is using the symbol of the temple to explain something that is very, very mystic, occult and true. So, listen to it again. As climbs a story temple tower to heaven, built by the aspiring soul of man to live near to his dream of the invisible, Infinity calls to it as it dreams and climbs. Its spire touches the apex of the world, mounting into great voiceless stillnesses. It marries the earth to screened eternities amid the many systems of the one, made by an interpreting creative joy. Alone it points us to our journey back out of our long self-loss, in nature's deeps, planted on earth, it holds in it all realms. So even though, like it's planted on earth, but it holds within its spire all the realms. You see how obviously a, a reference to the carved temples of India. It is a brief compendium of the vast. This was the single stair to being's goal. A summary of the stages of the spirit. It's copy of the cosmic hierarchy. So this, the same way the cosmic hierarchies are built. Refashioned in our secret air of self, a subtle pattern of the universe. So the temple is a subtle pattern of the entire universe. It is within, it is below, without, above. It is within us, it is below us, it is outside of us, all around us, and it is above us. This subtle pattern of the universe is encrypted in matter in the world and the same we see in different forms it is within below without above acting upon this visible nature scheme it wakens our earth matters heavy dose to think and feel and to react to joy so these worlds that Sri Aurobindo has and Ashwapati are traveling, what Sri Aurobindo is indicating here. These worlds are not something outside of the earth. They are from starting from the earth atmosphere. So it is just that they are invisible to us. But they extend upwards and upwards and upwards, just like a temple that has its base on earth moves upwards. So these worlds, that the book of the travel of the worlds, the world stair that he's describing here, the stair starts from where? From earth, yeah. Whatever you call it. It starts right from here. The world stair. So, read it again. Now the second part. A summary of the stages of the spirit. Its copy of the cosmic hierarchies refashioned in our secret air of self. A subtle pattern of the universe. It is within, below, without, above. 
acting upon this visible nature scheme, it wakens our earth matter's heavy dose to think and feel and to react to joy. It models in us our diviner parts, lifts mortal mind into a greater air, makes yearn this life of flesh to intangible aims, links the body's death with immortality's call. So this is what it does. This is a very important passage that explains to us why we have this yearning towards immortality. So lifts mortal mind into a greater air, makes yearn this life of flesh to intangible aims, to higher aims, links the body's death with the immortality's call, out of the swoon of the inconscience, it labors towards a superconscient light. Who is this it? Out of the swoon of the inconscience, it labors towards a superconscient light. If earth were all and this were not in her, thought could not be, nor life delights response. Okay? So, in a sense, what Sri Aurobindo is saying here is the eternity and the world stare, the whole conscious, the everything is connected and aligned to each other. If there was no connection and no alignment and if it was not within the light, the supreme light was not within the earth consciousness, whether it's the inconscient or the superconscient or the subconscious, if it was not there, it could not have awoken matter and man would not have this yearning towards immortality and something higher than itself. So this world stare, this you see the name of the chapter, the book two, the book of the traveler of the worlds. Canto one, the world stare. So what is this world stare? So the world stare, the stairway, world stare. So that stare. So when we are doing sadhana or yoga, what Sri was doing was sitting in his room. Okay? This obviously when he's doing the traveler of the worlds, he's not traveling anywhere. He's still sitting in Pondicherry. And he's traveling upwards into the different planes of consciousness. So this world stare is what is, he is ascending. Yeah, so it's important to know that this world stare, the base of it is in the, in matter, in the inconscient. Only material forms could then be her guests, driven by an inanimate world force. But the world force is animate and not inanimate. Only material forms could then be her guests, driven by an inanimate world force. Earth, by this golden superfluity, bore thinking man, and more than man shall bear. This higher scheme of being is our cause and holds the key to our ascending fate. It calls out of our dense mortality, the conscious spirit nursed in matter's house. So this higher scheme of being is our cause and holds the key to our ascending fate. It calls out of our dense mortality, the conscious spirit nursed in matter's house, the living symbol of these conscious planes. The living symbol of these conscious planes is the conscious spirit which is nursed in matter's house, in the inconscient. Its influences and godheads of the unseen, its unthought logic of reality's acts, 
arisen from the unspoken truth in things, have fixed our inner lives slow-scaled degrees. Its steps are paces of the soul's return from the deep adventure of material birth, a ladder of delivering ascent and rungs that nature climbs to deity. Once in the vigil of a deathless gaze, these grades had marked her giant downward plunge, the wide and prone leap of a godhead's fall. Our life is a holocaust of the Supreme. What does this line mean? Our life is a holocaust of the Supreme. What is a holocaust? So who our lives is a holocaust of the Supreme. What does that mean? The great world mother, by her sacrifice, has made her soul the body of our state. You remember the holocaust that took place in the World War II? So in the same way, uh, it is the Supreme who has, yeah, who has made, he has, you know, I don't know what other word, what is a synonym for Holocaust? Hmm? Who has wiped itself out so that body of our state, so our life, so that life can be born and so that man can be, and so that evolution can, this whole world can be created. So our life is a holocaust of the Supreme. So in a sense, if the Supreme has blown itself up to become the earth and life, destroyed, it's a holocaust is a thing that is, you know, is a, it's a kind of a explosion, no? What is a holocaust exactly? Can anyone read the dictionary meaning of holocaust? Is it a Latin? Uh, because, you know, Sri Aurobindo always goes to the root word of Holocaust. So is there a, anything that's in Latin or something? Is there another deeper, another meaning? And cataclysm. Hmm. So again, what did it say? It's a situation where... So basically there's a supreme here. It's one... Part. Ah, so this is where he's taking it. A sacrifice? In which the offering was burned completely on an altar. Hmm, Okay. So, basically the supreme sacrifice. Hmm, okay. The wide and prone leap of a godhead's fall. Our life is a holocaust of the supreme. The great world mother, by her sacrifice, has made her soul the body of our state. Accepting sorrow and unconsciousness, divinity's lapse from its own splendors wove the many patterned ground of all we are. An idol of self is our mortality. Our earth is a fragment and a residue. Her power is packed with the stuff of greater worlds and steeped in their color lusters, dimmed by her droves. An atavism of higher births is hers. So an atavism of higher births, that means already there is a... Atavism is something that's in the memory, you know, it's atavistic. Of higher births is hers. The great world mother by her sacrifice has made her soul the body of our state. Accepting sorrow and unconsciousness, divinity's lapse from its own splendors wove the many patterned ground of all we are. And then she says, her power, the mother's power, is packed with the stuff of greater worlds and steeped in their color lusters dimmed by her drows. An atavism of higher births is hers. Her sleep is stirred by their buried memories, recalling the lost fears from which they fell. So there is this atavism of higher births that is embedded in the consciousness of the earth and in the consciousness of all living things. Her sleep is stirred by their buried memories, the buried memories of the higher births, recalling the lost fears from which they fell. 
unsatisfied forces in her bosom move. In whose bosom move? In the great world mother's bosom. Unsatisfied forces in her bosom move. They are partners of her greater growing fate. So these unsatisfied forces are atavistic or they are the forces that have the buried memories of her higher births because don't forget she has sacrificed herself the holocaust of the divine mother to enter into earth nature and into the inconscient. So unsatisfied forces in her bosom move. They are partners of her greater growing fate and her return to immortality. So that is how she can return back to her true state of immortality. Because these, this atavistic memories are deeply buried in her and these partners, uh, these unsatisfied forces in her bosom are partners of her growing fate and her return to immortality. They consent, that's why if you read the first chapter of the life divine, Sri Aurobindo mentions there that there are the three things that man in his eternal pursuit, whichever way has always been after. What are the three? God, freedom and immortality. These are the three attributes of the Supreme. So of that, that is eternal. So they consent to share her doom of birth and death. As soon as you, she enters into the inconscient, into matter, and to the law of the material universe and earth, you are subject to the laws of the earth, which is birth, death, rebirth, and so on. So these partners of her growing fate also consent to share her doom of birth and death. So who is they? They kindle partial gleams of the all, and drive her blind, laborious spirit to compose a meager image of the mighty whole. So, these partners, they consent and then they kindle partial gleams of the all, the almighty all, and drive who's the great mother, the, her force, her blind, laborious spirit to compose a meager image, a smaller image of the mighty whole. The calm and luminous Intimacy within approves her work and guides the unseeing power. So this smaller image is the calm and luminousy, luminous intimacy within the psychic spark, the psychic power. Within approves her work and guides the unseeing power. His vast design accepts a puny start. An attempt, a drawing half done, is the world's life. Its lines doubt their concealed significance. Its curves join not their high intended close. Yet some first image of greatness trembles there. And when the ambiguous crowded parts have met, the many-toned unity to which they moved, the artist's joy shall laugh at reason's rules. The divine intention suddenly shall be seen. The end vindicate intuition's sure technique. A graph shall be of many meeting worlds, a cube in union crystal of the gods. A mind shall think behind nature's mindless mask, a conscious vast fill the old dumb brute space. This faint and fluid sketch of soul called man, so this faint and fluid sketch of soul called man, shall stand out on the background of long time, a glowing epitome of eternity, a little point reveal the infinitudes, a mystery's process is the universe. At first was laid a strange Anomalous base, a void, a cipher of some secret whole, where zero held infinity in its sum, and all and nothing were a single term. So both all and nothing were a single term. This, you know, this reminds you of this very important Sanskrit formula which 
has governed all of the digital world and computing and music and everything. You know, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. This is the infinity. So this is, you know, in a way, this is what he's saying, where zero held infinity in its sum and all and nothing were a single term mathematically. And this is how you could actually, these formulae have, are derivatives from something that is of the most eternal and, and the most um, basic nature of the universe. So, a little point revealed the infinitudes, a mysteries process is the universe. At first was laid a strange anomalous base, a void, a cipher of some secret whole, where zero held infinity in its sum, and all and nothing were a single term. So all and nothing, an eternal negative, a matrix naught, into its forms the child is ever born. Into its forms, this into this internal matrix, this eternal negative and matrix not, into its forms the child is ever born, who lives forever in the vasts of God. Now, if you can see, this is now I'm going right above our heads. So, this is the way that Savitri is. You have to read it once, let it incubate in you, and then. Next time when we read it again, everything will make perfect sense. A slow reversals movement then took place. A gas belched out from some invisible fire. Of its dense rings were formed these million stars. So here's the whole process of creation that uh, is being described. Uh, starting from the Divine Mother's actually entering in, into the, in conscience, into the matter. Capital is, is the Divine Child, the Divine Being that enters into, so, the Divine Force. A little point revealed the infinitudes, a mysteries process is the universe. At first was laid a strange anomalous base, a void, a cipher of some secret whole. Please note the two always are being are one, the whole and the void, the zero and the one, the sum and the this thing. So, where zero held infinity in its sum, and all and nothing were a single term, an eternal negative, and a matrix naught, into its forms the child is ever born. Well, it is the, so here the child is the, is actually the, the supramental it's force. Divine. No, 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 it's just the force. Into its forms the child is ever born, who lives forever in the vasts of God. A slow reversals movement then took place. And because the child is ever born and lives forever, therefore the reversal, the involution, then obviously goes, after the involution of the divine comes the evolution of the divine, the you can't have an evolution of something that is not already involved or already there. So the child is ever born and then this child evolves. So a slow reversals movement then took place. A gas belched out from some invisible fire. Of its dense rings were formed these million stars. Upon earth's newborn soil, God's dread was heard. Across the thick smoke of earth's ignorance, a mind began to see and look at forms and groped for knowledge in the nascent night. Caught in a blind stone grip, force worked its plan and made in sleep this huge mechanical world. So, and made in sleep this huge mechanical world, that matter might grow conscious of its soul. So, this huge mechanical world was made in sleep, caught in this stone grip force. The force worked its plan in the sleep of the inconscient. And why was this done? So that matter might grow conscious of its soul. And like a busy midwife, the life power deliver the zero carrier of the all. 
So, like a midwife, the life power, life power is prana, life force, is the midwife that delivers the zero carrier of the all. So, you again see the zero, infinity and the finite, zero, one. So, like the zero, deliver the zero carrier of the all. So, because the eternal eyes turned on earth's gulfs, the lucent clarity of a pure regard and saw a shadow of the unknowable mirrored in the inconscience boundless sleep creation's search for self began its stir. So it is only because the eternal eyes turned on earth's gulfs. How do the eternal eyes turn? By the coming down and the Holocaust of the Divine Mother's force which entered into the inconscient earth. And because these divine eyes turned to earth's gulfs, the lucent clarity of a pure regard and saw a shadow of the unknowable mirrored in the inconscient's boundless sleep, creation's search for self began its stir. So creation's Search only could begin because of this. For what? For self began its stir and that's how creation started. Otherwise, there would be no creation. There would only be the night, the ignorance and the inconscient and the darkness. Creation means something that is alive and that is that comes out of something that is uncreated. So creation's search for self began its stir. That's how the earth life began. A spirit dreamed in the crude cosmic world. Mind flowed unknowing in the sap of life. And matter's breasts suckled the divine idea. A miracle of the absolute was born. Infinity put on a finite soul. All ocean lived within a wandering drop. See the beautiful imagery and the way that Sri Aurobindo is trying to explain something that is unexplainable and is very difficult to understand by the our mind. Our mind cannot fathom something that is beyond it. So in words, how do you present something that is beyond the mental range of thought? and of conception. This is how he's doing it. A spirit dreamed in the crude cosmic world, mind flowed unknowing in the sap of life, and matter's breast suckled the divine idea. A miracle of the absolute was born. Infinity put on a finite soul. All ocean lived within a wandering drop. A time-made body housed the illimitable. A time-made body. What is this time-made body he's talking about? The entire earth. The earth is the time-made body. And everything that is on earth is the time-made body. Housed the illimitable. So is mind, man's body time-made. So is everything else. But here he's referring to The time-made body housed the illimitable. And time was created because of the awakening of consciousness, or from the inconscient, the divine that wanted to create and to find itself. So, began to look for itself. That created time, because time is finite. And that's how you can begin to know yourself. If you can begin to, you have to be able to, in the infinite there is no time. So that's why a time-made body housed the illimitable. To live this mystery out, our souls came here. And then, of course, to the human soul and the human and, you know, the human evolutionary aim of life to live this mystery, mystery out. He uses the word mystery a lot. You notice, if you actually do a search in Savitri, how many times he uses this word, you'll be surprised. And why he uses mystery is because some part of this whole 
yeah, this whole creation is mysterious. There is an element of mystery. And it's something that man's consciousness certainly cannot totally and fully fathom because we are a part of this. We are one little cog in this wheel. So our mind is not vast enough to fathom this mystery. And as soon, and, and therefore as we grow in evolution, in consciousness from man to superman to the higher levels of human consciousness and divine consciousness, maybe then this mystery will unfold itself. But right now we know there is something that is unfathomable, infinite, something that is mysterious. That's why you see this word, a mysteries process is the universe. Again he goes back, a time-made body house the illimitable. To live this mystery out, our souls came here, came here on earth, a seer within who knows the ordered plan. This, so the seer within could only be born because of the... Divine Mother's sacrifice and holocaust and entering into matter. A seer within who knows the ordered plan, concealed behind our momentary steps, inspires our ascent to viewless heights, at once the abysmal leap to earth and life. His call had reached the traveler in time, apart in an unfathomed loneliness, he travelled in his mute and single strength, bearing the burden of the world's desire, a formless stillness called, a nameless light. Above him was the white immobile ray, around him the eternal silences. No term was fixed to the high-pitched attempt, world after world disclosed its guarded bars, heaven after heaven its deep beatitudes, but still the invisible magnet drew his soul, a figure's soul on nature's giant stair. He mounted towards an indiscernible end. He is here, Ashwapati, on the bare summit of created things. So this last paragraph, a seer within who knows the ordered plan concealed behind our momentary steps inspires our ascent Humanity's ascent, our ascent, the evolutionary ascent to viewless heights as once the abysmal leap to earth and life. In the same way as the in the same way as once did the abysmal leap to earth and life. His call had reached the traveller in time. Hmm. Yeah, the seer's call. Apart in an unfathomed loneliness, he travelled in his mute and single strength. Bearing the burden of the world's desire. A formless stillness called. Called who? Ashwapati. A nameless light. Above him, above whom? Ashwapati. Was the white immobile ray. Around him the eternal silences. No term was fixed to the high-pitched attempt. World after world disclosed its guarded bars. Heaven after heaven its deep beatitudes, but still the invisible magnet with a capital M drew his soul. So even though he saw world after world, everything, something was drawing his soul like an invisible magnet drew his soul, a figure soul on nature's giant stair. Ashwapati, a figure soul on nature's giant stair. He mounted towards an indiscernible end, nowhere, on the bare summit of created things. End of Canto 1, the book of the traveller of the world. This is obviously Ashwapati's whole discovery of the mystery.